ठीक है सर थैंक यू Hello, hello. How are you? Hi, Good sir. to see you again. Yeah. Yeah. I brought my son and oh, wife good. along too. Yeah. Hi. Hi, man. This round, yes, geographers will come to the talk. Yeah, because I am very, I am very keen on geographers. Uh, as a part of the exercise that we discussed at uh, your office. Sir. So now people can describe the topic. They are going to idea briefly, very briefly, but they are going to say, but we now have somebody in charge who has uh, worked for a while, and then why don't we get involved? And I haven't. Extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, guests, esteemed faculty, and bright students to this public lecture being organized under the Delhi School of Economics Diamond Jubilee Lecture Series. We are honored to have with us today Shri Sanjeev Sanyal, Member, Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister, as our distinguished speaker. We welcome you, sir, to, to, to today's lecture. We also have with us on dais. Professor Ram Singh, Director, Delhi School of Economics, and Professor Pammi Dua, former Director, Delhi School of Economics. We commence today's event with the University Kulgeet and the Welcome Song. For that, I invite Nainika on stage to perform the Kulgeet and the Welcome Song. I request everyone to stand up for the Kulgi. you all to please take your seats. Tanabu 
समता मानवता समता ममता नित निरंतरता नवता मानवता समता ममता सारथी साथ मनोरथ का जो अनिवार्य नहीं थमता सारथी साथ मनोरथ का जो अनिवार्य नहीं थमता संकल्प अभिजित अभिमत संकल्प अभिजित अभिमत आनंद मंगल मंगल आनंद मंगल मंगल नित प्रिय भारत भारत नित प्रिय भारत भारत स्वागत शुभ स्वागत मत स्वागत शुभ स्वागत Thank you, Nainika. Now I invite Professor Ram Singh, Director, Delhi School of Economics, to deliver the welcome address. Thank you, thank you, Vishnu. Speaker of today's public lecture under the Diamond Jubilee celebration of the Delhi School of Economics, Sri Sanjeev Sanyalji. Former Director of the Delhi School of Economics, Professor Pamedua. My colleagues from uh, DSC Constituent Department, <coughs> Professor Surender Kumar, Head of Economics Department, Professor Anandita Datta, Head of uh, Geography Department, Professor Vasan, the Head of uh, Sociology Department, uh, Professor Rajiv Gupta, CEO of Institution of Eminence, uh, University of Delhi, Professor Simrit Kaur, Principal of SRCC, my esteemed colleagues uh, from departments, Department of Commerce, that used to be a constituent uh, department of Delhi School of Economics, and we consider the department uh, as our own. My esteemed colleagues from various departments and colleges of University of Delhi, my dear students, and those who have chosen to come to, to this uh, talk, I welcome you all. This talk, first of all, you know, from the, uh, the presence, uh, in this hall we can see popularity of the speaker. It uh, reaches uh, quite deep and wide. This talk is uh, part of uh, Diamond Jubilee celebration of Delhi School of Economics. As most of us present here know, Delhi School of Economics was set up in 1949 as Center for Excellence and Advanced Learning and Research in Social Sciences with Professor V. K. R. V. Rao as the founding director. The DSC started with the Department of Economics as the nucleus and comprises of departments of economics, geography, and sociology. The former constituents of the Delhi School of Economics include Department of Commerce. Professor V. K. R. V. Rao's vision for DSC was of an institution devoted to research, teaching in economics, and allied areas in social sciences with an aim to produce students who would play an important role in economic development and social progress of the country. Professor V. K. R. V. Rao had said, and I quote, I do have the strong conviction that there should be a marriage between theory and practice, and a balanced mixture of both in any sphere of knowledge and academic discipline to make it useful for policy purposes and the promotion of human welfare. Since its inception, the DSC, with its constituent departments, has been a premier postgraduate institution of academic excellence in India. Throughout 
its history of more than seven and a half decades, the DSC has been acknowledged worldwide for its academic standards and rigorous teaching and research techniques it imparts to its students. It has always attracted the best of students from within the country and in many cases from neighboring, neighboring countries as well. The D DSC students across departments have not only been well trained in rigorous theory with quantitative orientation, but also have a wider perception of important social issues facing the country. The DSC character is fostered in a culture where research, teaching, and engagement with national issues go hand in hand. Therefore, it comes as no surprise that the DSC community has actively contributed to the giant strides made by the nation on most indicators of social and economic development. Generations of <coughs> DU alums have served society with sincerity and determination and distinction. To quote Professor V.K. R. V. Rao again, after all, there are many universities, but only one Delhi School of Economics. Now, as the DSC has entered its 75th glorious year of existence, it is time for us to renew and reinvigorate the vision of our founders who believed in working for inclusive development through high quality education guided by social consciousness. The Diamond Jubilee Lecture Series is part of our mission for blending academic rigor with the real world of policy making. Today, we feel honored to have Sri Sanjeev Sanyalji as a speaker for this public lecture under the series. I welcome you all again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I now request Professor Ram Singh and Professor Pammi Dua to felicitate our distinguished speaker, Sri Sanjeev Sanyal, with a shawl and a memento. Sanjeev Sanyal is currently a member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. He was the principal economic advisor to the Finance Minister for five years till the February of 2022. He has represented India on many international forums, including as co-chair of the G20's Framework Working Group. During his time in government, he has been responsible for several key reforms and was part of the core team that managed the Indian economy during the COVID-19 pandemic. He was also one of the key architects of the G20's global action plan that kept the world economy functioning during the pandemic years. Prior to joining the government, he spent over two decades in financial markets and was global strategist and managing director at Deutsche Bank. An alumni of Sri Ram College of Commerce, Delhi, Mr. Sanyal later attended Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. He was awarded the Eisenhower Fellowship in 2007 for his work on urban dynamics. In 2010, he was named as Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum in Davos. He has been a visiting professor slash fellow of numerous institutions such as Oxford University, Royal Geographical Society, Institute of Public Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. He also chairs the Board of Advisors of the Delhi School of Public Policy and Governance. Mr. Sanyal is the author of a number of best-selling books including Revolutionaries, Land of the Seven Rivers, The Ocean of Churn, India in the Age of Ideas, The Incredible History of the Indian Ocean, and The Indian Renaissance. He has also published around 250 articles and columns in leading national and international publications. His writings have received many awards, including the Kalinga Book Award 2023, the International Achievers Award for Literature 2013, and the Art Carrot Award 2013, 2018. Sorry. We welcome you, sir, to this distinguished lecture, and we thank you for your presence. For the lecture title, Process Reforms, the Importance of Nuts and Bolts. Good. So good afternoon, everyone. So let me begin first by thanking my friend, Professor Ram Singh, for inviting me to come here today to speak to all of you and to Professor Pamik Dua, who I've known for a very, very long time, for agreeing to um, chair this session today. So what I'm going to talk about today is one of my pet subjects, uh, which is that of process reforms. Now, these are the nuts and bolts reforms that I will talk about. And I'll show you how, although these are things that very often 
the media uh, or even academia to some extent ignores, um, these are things that really have a big impact, even though they can be relatively small changes. So I'm going to hopefully um, uh, convince you that these are important changes to make and further convince you to do some research in this, because this is an area where we really want to put in some extra effort. So before I go any further, let me explain what on earth process reforms are. Because when you hear about reforms, of course, we have been now reforming our economy since 1991. So a lot of reforms have happened. And usually, you will hear the word structural reforms. right? So it's almost as if these are the only kinds of reforms. But if that was the case, why would you use the word structural? So structural reforms are all those very big, cool reforms that change the structure of a system. So those reforms can be, for example, the original delicensing and liberalization we did in 1991. After that, we did a lot of structural reforms. The more recent ones, for example, we introduced the uh, inflation targeting framework, right? To introduce a monetary policy committee. Professor Dua was a part of that. So that is a change in the structure of how macro stability is managed. So that's a structural change. GST. Yeah, GST, big change, which completely changed the way indirect taxes is done. So that's a structural change. The insolvency and bankruptcy code, that's also a structural change because you change the nature of creative destruction in a country, right? Those are big structural changes. But there is another class of reforms called process reforms. Now, at some level, these are not the big changes. Because I'm not attempting here to change the structure of something, although cumulatively you may end up changing the structure. But any individual one of these reforms is usually sector specific, microeconomic at some level, um, small changes, which essentially try to make a given structure work more effectively, efficiently, and so on. So that is really what a process reform is. We call it process reform because this is really about getting the process of whatever it is to run better rather than change the architecture, which is the structure. Yeah. So this is what I'm going to talk about. These are these nuts and bolts reforms, as I have called them earlier. But as you will see, they are absolutely critical. In fact, even to get structural reforms to be successful, you very often need to do a large number of these small iterative changes. So a lot of it is about iteration, feedback loop, and adjust. And those of you who have an interest in technology, <laughs> will immediately recognize it as being something similar to how software is introduced. Yeah, so this is how, you know, you know the term agile, for example. So think of this as coming from the same kind of school of idea, uh, thought. So I'm going to show you different kinds of process reforms that we have attempted, and I have personally done, uh, had something to do with, as examples of the kinds of process reforms that happen. This is not exhaustive. Maybe some of you will find other ways of doing it. I'm just giving this as illustration. But I think this will cover most things. So there are some kinds of process reforms where essentially you don't need to change anything but just streamline the existing process. These are the simplest kinds of process reforms you can do. That doesn't mean it doesn't have a big impact. It can have a large impact, but they're simple to do administratively. You don't have to change the laws. You don't have to hire new people. <clears throat> you don't have to even change the regulations. So given the system as it is, you just make it work a little bit better. So that is, I'll give you an example of it shortly. Streamlining, this is the streamlining of an existing process. Another can be that you have to change the regulations under a certain law. So it's very important you understand the difference between them. You see, when a law makes its way, through the parliament and ultimately it gets gazetted and becomes a law of the land, that is not how actually the system uses the law. The department or ministry which uses is responsible for that law will ultimately create rules and regulations. That is what really applies to you for the day-to-day -day functioning. And very often, that those regulations need some changing. So that is another kind of uh, process reform, you change the regulations under a given law. Then there is a third one where you have to actually go and change the law itself. Uh, this is obviously more complicated. 
you have to think of a of an amendment or even a new law then you have to send it to a parliamentary committee then you have to take its way through supposing it's a state law through the legislative process a legislature state legislature or if it's a national law you will have to take it through um, the lok sabha rajya sabha assent of the uh, uh, of the president then it will appear and then after doing that you again have to write those regulations uh, uh, again and so on so this is much more complicated can be done but i'm just pointing out slightly more i mean significantly more complicated then there are some kinds of uh, reforms you can do where you need to add a capacity so the laws are all fine that's not where the problem is the regulations are fine it just is that there is a bottleneck in in somewhere in the process where you need to add some capacity in the government in order to remove a bottleneck so you have to widen the pipeline so to speak and then a last type where you actually have to remove something so you have to remove some government state mandated activity some requirement and so on which is getting in the way not serving the purpose or the purpose can be served in a better way in some other way and you remove that so i've given you five different ways in which you can do it if you find a new one let me know i'll add to the presentation so here goes one example of the first type which is administrative streamlining and i'm going to give you the example of voluntary liquidation of companies so what is voluntary liquidation of companies so you see companies get liquidated all the time now one reason they get liquidated is because they go bankrupt or insolvent etc so you know they have to be therefore liquidated but there are large number of companies which are doing perfectly well but for variety of reasons you may want to shut it down it may be because the entrepreneur who is running that company has finally got bored of running it he's retired wants to retire and wants to shut it down sometimes it's because there is a large company large company that's got all kinds of branches and you know sub companies and it wants to consolidate them um there may be many other reasons why you know technology has changed regulation has changed whatever reason there are large number of people who want to every year shut down perfectly functioning companies and so that is voluntary liquidation of companies now some of you who happen to come from business background may already know about this problem that in india if you actually want to shut down a company voluntarily it's an extremely excruciating painful thing it's like it's like extracting teeth almost it takes years and it's no fun for everybody so we looked into this matter and we said that look we need to do something about this so we me and <coughs> my team we dug into this and we discovered that there are actually two ways to shut down a company through for voluntary liquidation so if you wanted to do it for bankruptcy there is obviously the insolvency in bankruptcy code but if you wanted to just shut it down and there is no real big dispute and so on the system of doing it is through something called the section 248 of the companies act of 2013 and this is the main route through which this is done although after the insolvency and bankruptcy code was introduced there is also a section 59 which can also be used for shutting down a company both of them work although the companies act route is at least so far the more popular route and so we when we were looking into this in june 2021 that's a little over 2 years ago we discovered that as of june 2021 there were 28536 such pending cases of voluntary liquidation now these are not companies where there's some dispute that you know there's nobody you no know, tax authority nobody is saying you shouldn't shut it down everybody agrees it should be shut down and yet nearly 10% of these were pending for more than 1000 days 54% of them were pending for more than one year so more than half of these were pending for over a year even though everybody agrees it should be shut down and remember if a company has not been shut down you still have to do all the company things i you have to hold it shareholder meeting you have to uh, do all its accounts even if there's no money in it you still have to do the accounts and you have to and you can't sell off the assets etc etc so you have to keep these there's a expense to keeping these companies going so if nobody wants to keep them alive and there's no objection to it why are more than 50% of the companies kept being kept alive similarly we found that those who wanted to go through the insolvency bankruptcy system there were 968 cases that had been initiated final reports had been submitted for 438 out of which only 230 had been actually dissolved 
Now, this was at that time quite new, so there are many more cases than this right now. But nevertheless, 251 cases were ongoing, of which 31 had been there for more than two years, 23 for between one and two years. So there were a large number of companies that are hanging around for years, and we couldn't shut it down. So we began to look into why this was happening. And this is what we discovered. We discovered that, you see, according to Section 248, when you wanted to shut down a company, the company's name has to be actually advertised in the newspapers. Why? Because in case there is some person who is owed money by that company, after it's shut down, it's shut down, it disappears from the face of the earth. So it has to, you have to say that, look, this company is being shut down. If somebody, you are owed money, please go and get it. So you have to advertise this. Fair thing. However, it turns out that the department of the government that is supposed to publish these names and they have to advertise it, took sometimes six months, sometimes a full year before publishing these names. Now, there's no reason why it is true. It's just the way it was. There's an obscure department, obscure rather sub departments, you know, there's some section in the Ministry of Corporate Affairs who nobody, including the secretary of that ministry, knows about, whose job it is to publish these things. And frankly, they don't really care. And not even going to get into possible rent seeking and so on. But basically, they used to publish it whenever they felt. Sometimes they didn't publish it. And for months, if not years, names just would not get published. Now, this doesn't require any deep thing to do. It doesn't require real change. It doesn't rule. It doesn't require additional people. It just meant that you don't publish it. Similarly, for those who were going through the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code route, they had to get a whole bunch of NOCs from the tax department, this department, that department for shutting it down. Now, we discovered that actually the IBC court section in which they were using does not actually require these NOCs. This was just somehow, for some reason, the procedure had just ended up demanding these NOCs, even though on paper, none of these NOCs were needed. So, very simple change. We just got the Ministry of Corporate Affairs to begin publishing these advertisements of the names with ROCs in the newspapers more quickly. Didn't require us to do anything. In fact, my own view is we should actually change the law and not even require this because this should be actually, as soon as you put in the application, it should be in the website. Why are we putting it into newspapers? Who reads them anyway? Two, same thing we did with IBC, we introduced a clarification which was issued, the saying that there was no requirement of NOC from the income tax department, that's all. Now both of these change, look what happens as a result. So for the section 248 companies, as of June 2023, not only has the pending cases reduced to 8,800 from 28,500 two years earlier, only about 12% of them down from 54% earlier, were pending for more than one year. So you can see, almost no effort. You just had to go to that sub, some subsection officer and tell them, advertise and make nikal lo. That's all. And 20,000 companies in one year benefited from it. Just think about the benefit of this. Similarly, for the IBC, as of 2023, 1,607 corporate persons have initiated voluntary liquidation under IBC, out of which final reports have been come out for 69%. We have, however, found so far that 571 cases have been closed by dissolution. In other words, the pipeline has become smoother, but the final disposal rate has not improved disproportionately. So this is something that we need to still look at. But I give you a flavor of very basic feedback loops. Just going and seeing what's going on, and it dramatically changes things. I'll give you another example. Now we are going into type 2 changes, where we actually need to change regulations. Now, you all know that the IT BPO sector, the IT enabled sector, is a very big sector for India not just internally, it's a huge part of our exports. Yeah, Everybody knows that. <coughs> However, we had a very strange situation that there were all these bizarre 
telecom ministry regulations that the IT BPO sector had to comply with till about two years ago. Nobody outside of this sector knew about them, but the people in those sectors found that you know, more than half of the management time of that sector related to trying to keep track of them. The question is, how did I discover this? So I happened to be at that time in the, in the finance ministry as the principal economic advisor. And COVID had just hit us. Right? This is April of 2020. And telecom ministry came up with a notification which basically meant, said that all of you can now work from home till December 2020. Now I've worked in long I've worked long enough in government by that point to immediately get suspicious. So if a ministry is telling you that I'm allowing you to do something that I would have thought was a right anyway and was allowed anyway, and is saying that you are allowed to do this till the particular date, what it is really doing is not giving you an exemption. What it is really doing is telling you that in normal times these laws actually apply. That is what it is actually trying to tell you. So since I am a suspicious sort of chap, I decided to look into this. And I discovered something quite horrifying. It turns out that working from home was actually illegal. And that all of you were doing illegal things. Because if you wanted to use the telecom lines to do some work from home, you were all supposed to have an EPA BX machine in your basement. I'm not kidding about this. That is what the telecom laws actually meant. So here are the funny things I found in this. So there was something called the revised terms and conditions of the other service providers, which is the code word for IT BPO sector. Other service providers, this law was introduced in 2008, which meant that there were these following cumbersome requirements. First of all, there was no clear definition of what an other service provider was. It could pretty much be anybody, as from, from what I gathered. So depending on who the officials of the telecom ministry wanted, they could just define you as an OSP. Then, as I said, they required, there was a requirement that if you're working using telecom networks, you actually had to keep local infrastructure. What was that infrastructure? It was an EPA BX machine, which you had to have in your premises. Now, I'm 100% sure that there's nobody in this room below the age of 40 who even knows what a PPA BX machine is. It's a 1980s technology. And in this universe of cloud, it's a completely absurd thing to require anybody to have, even a large company to have an EPA BX machine at all. But that is what actually was a requirement. You required separate registration for each OSP. So for example, if there was a BPO, and you had different locations, it wasn't good enough to actually require want, uh, get yourself a one license to do it. If you created another small unit somewhere, you needed a separate registration and go through the whole process again for that separate location. And finally, you couldn't share between the domestic and international. So just imagine OSP, let's say you are for uh, an OSP, you're the back office of Singapore Airlines, just random random example. So you are Singapore Airlines, you have created a back office for your ticketing, uh, your baggage claims, whatever it is, you created a, a, a back office in India. Now, the Indian guy who is calling in to find out about his ticketing, etc., he can call one uh, BPO, the guy calling from an international has to call another BPO. So they cannot be shared that this, this thing cannot be shared. Now, there is no real benefit from this, just a random requirement. And it is quite extraordinary. Let's imagine what the problem will be. Supposing I happen to be an Indian who happened to live in Singapore, bought a ticket in Singapore, came to India, and then had a problem with my flight. Am I Indian or am I international? I'm sitting in Delhi. Where should I call? Should I call the international line or should I call the domestic line? And, and how on earth is the airline to know who on earth is calling and where to send you? So this is a completely pointless requirement. And yet, this requirement 
led to all kinds of complications, months of delay, again large amounts of rent seeking of all kinds. So all of these restrictions we began to dig into. Oops. So after identifying these regulations, we then decided we will change these things and so a simplified OSP regulation was issued in November 2020. We discovered that it wasn't good enough and then we went further in June 2021 and we completely liberalized it. So now what happens, there's a clear definition of OSP which basically means today, talks, it's a requirement for voice over PPO services and since voice based telecom services are anyway dying, so it really doesn't, it's, it's a rapidly diminishing segment. But at least you have a clear definition of OSP and they are the only people to whom this applies. There is interconnectivity between infrastructure, sharing between OSPs that is allowed. There is a guideline that allows use of EPABX at foreign locations, cloud, whatever, you don't really need to have to care about having an EPABX machine. You can work from home on remote locations as you wish. And there is a removal of a distinction between domestic and international OSPs. So all of these things were done. And this is the kind of relief the BPO ITES sector felt. And it was big enough that, by the way, pretty much every major player in that sector, when these laws rules came out, they tweeted thanking the government. Because this was such a big headache and they thought that they'll never be able to get rid of it. But when it happened, you know, whether it's Nandan Nilikani, Mohandas Pai, you name it, you know, the head of TCS, everybody tweeted saying this is fantastic. And just to show you what we found, so a December 2021 NASCOM result said that whether OSP reforms had helped in reducing compliance burden and 92% of them said that they had, it had helped them. How much of the reduction had happened? Well, 28% said that 50% of their compliance burden had disappeared because of these rule changes. And as you can see, you know, almost everybody else saw major changes as well. Whether OSP re reforms will make voice-based services more competitive, 94% thought it would. Whether removal of local EPABX requirement helped in improving ease of doing business, 85% said it would. OSP reforms, positive impact on the industry, as you can see, 62%, all of the above, all the different ways in which it helped. The point I'm making is, here was a bunch of rules that were just hanging around there, outdated, even in 20, 2008 when the new rules came, they were already outdated by more than a decade, and yet they sat around. And we finally got rid of them. These are not reforms you may have ever heard of, right? These are not great structural reforms. When it did happen, there was some buzz about it, but it was even then at, on the third page of the newspaper. But dramatic impact on how the competitiveness of our sector improved. And in 2021 and 22, as you will remember, there was a sharp increase in our services exports. Well, OSP reforms was one of the very key reasons why we suddenly became much more competitive. Third kind of changes. Here, we need actually legislative changes. So this relates to process reforms where their underlying laws need to be changed. So this is a comp more complicated thing we need to do. So let me ask, who in this room knows what on earth a legal metrology act is? Or what is legal metrology? How many of you even know what it is? Anybody here? Nobody knows. Yeah, okay, there is one person here who knows what it is. Yeah. 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 So legal metrology are the rules that impact weights, measures and labels. Right? You're all actually victims of legal metrology act. On a daily basis you're interacting with legal metrology of in some form or the other. Any product you use, the labels all coming from the legal metrology type rules or the labeling laws. Not many people know about it and yet this is probably the single biggest source of headaches for anybody doing any kind of manufacturing in this country. And probably the single biggest source of small level retail harassment and corruption in this country. So let me show you what happens. 
So it turns out that in section 25 to 47 of chapter 4 of the 2009 Legal Metrology Act, enumerates a bunch of offenses relating to weights, measures, etc. And many of these provisions are criminalized. And they are criminalized in a very peculiar way. So when you do the first offense, then you can pay a small fine. But on the second offense, you can be sent to jail for as long as seven years. So you can imagine what exactly happens. So let me show you some data what happens. Oops. Ah. So look at the table uh, there and it will show you the data for the number of cases booked on the first offense and the number of cases of the second offense. So as you can see that every year something like somewhere in the la range of 1 lakh odd cases are done on the first offense. So they are the first offense. But the second offense there are almost none. Country our size only has in 20, 21, 22, 11 cases. And of the number that I actually found it to the court of law is only seven cases. So this must suggest that we must be a genuinely honest people. How does this happen? Especially when you are having, you know, tens of thousands, if sometimes more than a lakh cases in the first offense. Now, so when we began to look into this, the general stand of the officials was, look, this works wonderfully, see, a wonderful law. You know, you just have to warn them once and make them pay a small fine and then nobody ever does it a second time. In reality, what actually happens is very obvious. For very minor infractions, the inspectors actually catch a uh, uh, an entrepreneur, maybe you know, a small variation in the label, small variation of weight or something. You know, sometimes it's something like, you know, if for gram, you, instead of G, you have written GM. And there are different, slightly different laws in different states now. So you can imagine what happens. So a very small infraction, they'll say, no, no, don't worry, you pay 2,000 rupees and you can be off. But you see, once you have done the first offense, you are now a slave for life. Because the second offense, you can be sent to jail for seven years. So now I'll leave it to your imagination to what exactly happens as a result of this. So this issue we discovered, and you can see that the, the, the data for this is quite obvious. We began to dig into and look at where are the real issues. And so recently, the Jan Vishwas Bill of 2022, which has now make, made its way through Parliament, we got rid of a bunch of the, uh, uh, one, uh, the, the provisions which had the most extreme punishment, seven years and so on. So we have got rid of some of them. There are some more left, about section 30, 33, 36, which are not such extreme punishments, but in fact, 80% of the cases happened under it. So this is something that needs to be re-examined. I have written extensively on this. You can read about it. I've written uh, working papers on this. I've written newspaper articles on it. And so this is the kind of reform that we now want to do to try and decriminalize this. This is, does not mean that we throw it into the bin. At the end, consumers too do need to be protected. So this is an important law. I'm not saying it isn't. But it has to be done in a graded way, which is commensurate to the sin that has been committed. So, work in progress, but just as an example of a law and a change in progress. And again, when this, hopefully when this thing happens, and it will in not too distant future, it is almost certainly going to appear in the fifth page on some, hopefully in some newspaper. And when you read it, do realize why it is important. Another change. Here, type 4. So this is where, this is an area where we need to expand capacity. As you can see that I am basically a uh, fairly skeptical about um, state officials and usually quite skeptical about expanding the state. But there are areas where you do need to do it. And here is one example. You all know that we all have, you know, India has great aspirations for the knowledge economy. We have aspirations for the knowledge economy, 
then one of the things you need to fix is the intellectual property rights infrastructure. Yeah, fair? I don't think anybody disputes this. This basically is about copyrights, trademarks, and very importantly, patents. Yeah? Now, the problem is that although we have this aspiration, our patenting system is far behind the peers who we want to compete with. So here is the data for this. I've given the data for filings and grants for China, US, and India. India is the last column. And you can see that not so long ago, which is 2016, just uh, six years ago, India had 45,000 odd filings, of which 9,800 odd grants were given. So we were not even giving 10,000 patents out every year. And note who we are competing with. The US, which grants 3 lakh patents a year, and China that was at that stage granting 4 lakh patents a year. Now, there's some dispute about the quality of patents that China gives and utility patents and all that. I don't want to get into the debate. But even if you do some reasonable research and cull out the more not so great patents, but even then, China still is giving out a very large number of patents, maybe a lakh or something thereabouts. So it's still in a totally different scale from the kinds of number of patents we are generating. And it is well known that it took years and years to get a patent in India. It is the longest, you know, some patents were taking five, six years. There are patents hanging around for seven, eight, nine years also. Now, come on, this is technology. How can you expect somebody to patent, patent when the technology itself will become irrelevant? Or even worse, somebody else will actually patent it in some other country and carry on. So this is, requires timely intervention. So some work has been going on in this, and as you can see, this patenting has, this patenting process has been improved in India. So between 2016, where we were not even doing 10,000 patents a year, we are now doing, last year, 2022, we did about 34,000 patents. Good work, but notice that meanwhile, China has gone to almost 8 lakh patents. Again, a lot of it is garbage, I agree, but still, you can see the scales. And the US is, of course, doing 3,25,000 patents. So this is the level difference. So if we want to get into this game, we really have to do something. So we went and looked at, was it the case that our processes were bad, our laws were bad? What is the real problem? So yes, there were problems. All the problems I discovered in the previous few three types were there. The process is slow, there are some laws here, there, etc. But the biggest problem actually was that our poor patent officers were working actually rather well. There just weren't enough of them. So we discovered that the manpower employed in the patent office was only 900. And this is after recent improvements. All these increases in grants happened in recent times. We had only 900 people working in the patent offices compared to 13,700 in China and over 8,000 in the US. So just imagine a cricket match. Your opponent brings in 13.7 players and you're bringing in 0.9 players to the team, to the field. Doesn't require too much imagination who's going to lose. So this is one area where you can, should add to the capacity. And by the way, this is an area where the government actually makes money. When you do patent filing, when you get a patent, you actually have to pay a fee to the government. So this is a profit-making department. So not only should you be increasing it for IPR reasons, actually this is a good case for increasing number of people in the government for making money from purely revenue perspective. So here is how things have been. So the first round of increases of people that happened ha happened at the examiner level. Now, you need to understand this very clearly, that there are two levels for getting a patent. First, when you put in the patent application, it goes to an examiner who does a preliminary thing that at least you followed the basic rules. It falls in, you paid the fees, etc. It's in the correct format. So that is called the examiner level. After you cross the examiner level and you presumably answered some basic questions, etc., that may have been given, you then have to go to the final disposal level where the controllers sit. And this is where the real thappa is given. 
Now what happened is that as new young people were brought into the examiner level, they began to speed up the examiner level. So you can see that there were a huge pendency in 2017-18 at the examiner level. You can see 1,67,000 patents were stuck there, pendency. And over the next five years, that pendency dramatically came down as young people were brought into the examiner level and some efficiency improvements happened. The pendency dramatically dropped. And so by 22, 23, we had, as you can see, I think some, I can't read the number myself, I have to admit, but it's something like, um, you know, 3,000, I think it's 3,200 or thereabouts uh, number of patents that are there. But that didn't help the cause too much because what happened is that all of these went through the examiner level and ended up in the next level. So you can see the pendency there dramatically went up. So in the same period, the pendency level, as you can see, by 21, 22, you had 1,80,000 patents pending. Slight improvement in the latest number, it's gone down to 1,67,000. In fact, it's quite interesting that if you go back to 17, 18, you had 1,67,000. And now uh, at the exam, if you look at, if you go to the previous slide, a uh, previous chart, at the examiner level where there were 1,67,000 uh, pendants, now all those chaps seem to have five years later ended up in the controller level. Doesn't help the cause, right? It's all piled up. So what we are now doing is beginning to change many, many things. So the first thing we did is, of course, we began to change a few obvious things. One is that we used to allow, sorry, hang on, we used to allow people right up to the end to, you know, if there is somebody who wants to question the patent, they were allowed right up to the last day to go and question, raise a question. Now, you can imagine what happens. Supposing I want to pen, put up a patent, we've gone through the entire process, and the last day, my uh, corporate or other competitors will go and put a question. Now, the whole process will get jammed. So, we have introduced, you know, a six months period where you can do it, and so there are other changes. But the biggest change we, we are now doing is simply doing a massive amount of hiring. So this number of 900 officers will, in the next 18 months, become around about 2,000. And over time, we will take this up and up. And the idea is that this will go up very sharply. So this year, we are thinking we will do about 50 to 60,000 patents a year. Two years from now, we expect to do 1 lakh patents a year. At least then we will be in the game. So that is another example of a reform. The final type of reform is removing a state mandated requirement. So this is somewhere where it's the opposite of what I did in the previous one, where instead of in adding something, here I'm going to remove something that the state wants you to do. And this involves a mandatory activity that is there by law which, at least in my view, serves absolutely no purpose. So, there was something called recently, you may have heard of the Mediation Bill 2021. Now, what is mediation? Mediation is basically the activity where, supposing there are two, uh, there's a dispute between two parties. One is to go to case, go, go to court, fight the case, etc., litigation. But the other is that there is a process of mediation by which both parties are brought to the table. There is a mediator and he tries and kind of mediates between them, in, you know, the English word mediates between them and they come to some agreement that is uh, somewhat uh, less confrontational. So this is a process that is being encouraged and there is good reason, you know, uh, there is so much load on the courts, maybe there is another way of doing it. So a mediation bill was introduced to give this mediation process some legal teeth and a basis. But as a part of that, when the bill appeared, that bill said that they were going, for civil cases, they were going to make it mandatory to do a mediation first before going to court. Now when the parliamentary committee looked at it, it said that why do you are you forcing people to go to court if 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 you know I and my neighbor have a dispute over the hedge? Maybe you you know a mediator can help, 
but a very large proportion of the cases will probably i probably have already had a third neighbor who's tried to mediate and it hasn't worked so if i am already gone to court very likely that it's not going to work so make it voluntary why are you making it mandatory so this is the logic they used and so this mandatory provision was removed so when i'm doing the research into this i discovered that actually for commercial cases interestingly it was mandatory now this is a peculiar situation because it means that if there is a commercial dispute the two companies have to go and mediate attempt to mediate first so in order to see whether you wanted to do it somewhere else you should at least go and see whether it has worked in the first place you tried why should you have mandatory pre litigation mediation what has worked what has happened as a result of it so we looked into the data for this and we found data and by the way this happens under this is <clears throat> under the section 12a of the commercial courts act of 2015 so this is not something we can blame on you know the british left us or something that happened in ancient times all of these are recent laws 2015 is when this was made mandatory so as a part of that we began to look into this issue and we looked at the data from two commercial courts district level commercial courts in mumbai which is a obvious thing to do because um that's our commercial capital so good place to go and start and we found something quite interesting we found that for 98% of the cases the two parties did not even turn up for the mediation they did just didn't want to get going and even in the 2% of cases where they did turn up and they did try something only 1% actually it worked out to some solution the other case also failed so therefore for 99% of the cases this mandatory pre litigation mediation process was a complete failure and yet everybody had to do it it added something like 3 to 5 months extra to an already long and slow litigation process of course it was loved by the lawyers so law fact guys may not agree with my assassination uh, but my assessment of the situation so don't tell them but the result of this was we jammed up the entire process it's a complete waste of time so just yesterday i have published a working paper on this why we need to get rid of mandated mandatory uh, pre litigation um, uh, sorry pre litigation um, mediation in commercial litigation and hopefully i will make a case for this and let me see if i can succeed pushing it pushing uh, it into voluntary i mean i am not against mediation by the way just in case you anybody has the impression i think it's a good thing i just think it should be voluntary and if it's not working let the parties decide and this is true for everything every process must earn its place under the sun if it is such a good thing then people will go for it voluntarily you don't need to mandate it and if you mandate it then there is no incentive for those who are in that sector to improve their services so i have a big believer that this has to be done and it has to be converted from mandatory to voluntary so what is the conclusion that one should reach from this first of all there is a lot to be done in process reform and as i hope i have been able to convince you that these are important reforms that not only i'm not just talking about media but even in academia the amount of thought research etc that is done in these of somewhat obscure reforms is quite limited and certainly very little reform uh, very little attention is given to them as a class so you may look at individual reforms but very little research on them is done as a class of reforms and so this is something i wanted to bring attention to you maybe i've inspired a few people in the audience to look at this i have of course talked about five different ways of doing it uh, but they don't always fit into neat boxes i do want to point this out in some cases you may need to combine them Uh, maybe i have tried to solve it in one way maybe there's another way of solving it so don't think of them as nice neat boxes those five types i invented i just invented at the top of my head maybe there's a better way of categorizing them this is not written in stone my main purpose here was to show you how to think about this category of reform and to show you 
that as a government, we are continuously taking feedback and trying to make this iterative process through which we are trying to make uh, ease of doing business, make the economy a little more um, efficient. And the cumulative effect of all these small, small reforms ultimately is the thing that will ultimately make us, hopefully in the next three, four years, the third largest economy in the world. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, sir, for your riveting and deeply informative presentation. I'm sure all of us in the audience have greatly appreciated you for all of your efforts today. Now I hand over the mic to Professor Pammi Dua for her remarks and the Q&A session. A very good afternoon to everyone here. On behalf of everyone present here, I thank our distinguished speaker for an extremely enlightening, lucid, informative, and most importantly, inspiring lecture. I want to tell all of you, share with all of you, that this is not the first time that he has visited the Delhi School of Economics, and that this is also not the first time that he has inspired generations of students, and I emphasize generations of students, and I'm sure that he is also not aware of this. So, uh, just going back to almost 25 years, the economics department here had just started the placement cell. And now, also referring to what Professor Ram Singh said about the marriage between the real world and the theory that we teach here, so the question at that time was, how do we prepare our students for the private sector, for the corporate sector? Because 25 years ago, everyone thought that our students can only do a teaching job or go to the civil services. So I was given this arduous but very exciting task of trying to train our students to face job interviews of the corporate sector. And at that time, almost like, a gift of God. So Sanjeev Sanyal walks in and says, can I talk to your students? And I said, wow, this is great because that would be a wonderful way to start the placement cell. And then he engaged with the students here. And not only that, uh, if I remember correctly, he was with Deutsche Bank at that time. Yeah. And he used to write regularly on the Indian economy and the global issues. And his reports were very insightful, very informative. And more than that, he shared his reports with me. And in turn, I shared it with all the economic students who were preparing for their job interviews. So his stories became a textbook for our students. And therefore, what he may have thought was a small change made a big impact on the Delhi School of Economics. I didn't know that. <laughs> so I think this is a great platform for me to share something that I don't think anyone else knows here. And I would like to call this a process reform at the Delhi School of Economics. <laughs> now, I see. Um, so thank you very much, Sanjeev. I also want to mention that uh, the economics department placement cell has completed 25 years of its existence. It started in 1998-99. Delhi School of Economics, as Professor Ram Singh has already said, is in its 75th year. And we are in a historic moment in the university. The university, as you know, uh, has just completed 100 years. And let me also say that this is no ordinary coincidence. And we value your presence here today to be a part of three big celebrations and also to honor you for the impact you have had on this institution. So, um, So 
So now I think we can start the Q&A session. So uh, we will take two, three questions and then you can respond to them, yeah? So the first question, yes, we have Professor Chandrasekhar here. Thank you for a very insightful, very, very interesting lecture. Uh, about your point, the last point about mediation, uh, you seem to be uh, arguing for a more liberal approach of doing a mediation. But uh, can't it be argued that probably not only mandatory mediation, but the mandatory appearance of the parties in the mediation should be the, that means a more rigorous approach, more conservative rather than liberal approach. Can't it be argued that way? Your thoughts, please. We can take a bunch of them, yeah. Next question. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Rajiv Gupta here. Uh, well, I think you can hear. All right, okay. Uh, we can take from. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for the enriching lecture. So I'm a PhD. Little closer to your mouth. I'm a PhD research scholar at Delhi School of Economics. My question is uh, about the electricity uh, discom sector primarily. Do you envision any form of process reforms there? And have they been carried out uh, already? And at a state level, uh, how do you see the process reforms being decentralized and uh, improving the efficiency of our economy? Uh, thank you, Professor Rajiv Gupta here in front. Yes. I'll take three and then, you know, otherwise I'll forget them. <laughs> yeah, a very interesting talk. So I come from sciences, not from this uh, community. So, you know, uh, we as a society, as a country are against reforms. And uh, so my question is like, you know, we are very slow when we think about, when we do about the reform. So how to do reform, reform? So, uh, thank you, Professor Rajiv Gupta. Yeah. yeah, let me, otherwise I'll begin forgetting them. <laughs> so um, the first point is about mandatory and, you know, if 98% are not even turning up, why not force them to come? Well, the fact of the matter is that in India particularly, people go to the court only when they absolutely have to. Because it's a painful process even if you win, right? Um, so therefore, the fact that people are at all going to the court means that you have already attempted many other forms. And in any case, the fact that they're not turning up means that they don't want to mediate because the mediation process, whether they, because they hate each other or because the mediation process itself is not earning its keep. So therefore, why force people to do it? If it begins to work so well and the mediators are good, then the process will itself work. Why force people to do this? Because actually what is happening, I'll tell you, it's even worse than what I actually said. There is a provision in that same thing about ma mandatory mediation which allows certain kinds of exceptions and exemptions. Now what is happening is that all these 98% are actually paying lawyers more fees for trying to make sure that they are somehow accounted for in the, those exemptions and accounts. So you have the absurd situation of even more fees being paid to the lawyers to and all kinds of complete and both and by the way the parties may hate each other but on this one thing they both agree that they must both get exemption of some sort in, in order to be able not to have to go to the mediator. Now, why force people to do something nobody wants to do? And especially when it's not even working. So my view is, look, like any process, it has to come through the feedback loop. If the feedback loop is that it is not working, is the system. If after a few years we discover that mediation process has suddenly become a very good thing, they will begin going there. I don't have to force people to go. So as a feedback loop thing, maybe in 2015 they thought it would work. It hasn't worked. So fine, let's just change it. In fact, that's one of the points I'm trying to make in this process thing. They don't have to be ideological about anything. Right? Look at what happened as a result of a certain change you made. Did it work or didn't it work? The data will tell you it did, did work or didn't work. If it didn't work, change it. If it did work, great, carry on. So. That is my general approach on this matter. The second matter is on DISCOMs. It's a very complicated issue. Uh, it's not a central government issue, so I have not applied my mind because it is really a state government issue and I have to be very careful what I say here because I am a central government official. Um, but 
your secondary sort of embedded question in this which relates to the next one is relating to getting this to be done routinely at the state levels and frankly some states are better at this than others so there are states that have begun to do routine these kinds of changes and states by the way which we wouldn't have earlier so there are states that are generally better so you know uh, the southern states gujarat maharashtra these are generally better at doing these kinds of things but in the last two years my experience is that up has suddenly begun to do reforms faster than others so it's not that it couldn't do it so political leadership matters um the business elite the bureaucratic elite of a state want to do something they can do it um i'll give you an example like another one of odisha right odisha is not historically considered a cutting edge state in any way and yet significant changes and very slow but steady changes have happened and you know the business climate of odisha has done quite well and not just business climate you know the delivery of services etc has so over time somewhat improved still lot to lot to do but it has improved so there are many states assam another example where things are improving so point i'm making is it's not that it's not possible but it does require leadership and this is why it's very important to remember while whether it is structure you know in structural reform it's very obvious that the some big big person in that system has to push it but in process reforms while you do not need the top political leadership to push every little bit it does require a certain culture that has to be created that this becomes a routine part of doing these reforms so i mentioned here five five reforms because that's the time i had but let me tell you that india's current growth is heavily dependent on all kinds of these kind of small reforms that have happened in the recent years even during covid we opened up the drone sector we opened up the space sector we opened up the geospatial sector we privatized uh, air india all of these were small things okay air india one is quite high profile but most of the others if you were not in that sector you wouldn't have noticed but it's now routine every ministry every department is kind of incentivized ki ha batao naya kya kar kiya tumne and that most of the orientation is towards ease of doing business smoothening the process or if you are a welfare department then delivery of that to the last mile delivery is that good are you using technology so there is continuous pressure to do something feedback loops are taken and progress is made and some some of those things may not work but the difference here is that you are doing feedback loop so some if it didn't work you change it after all it is this government who created that mandatory thing 2015 ka act hai. we are ourselves saying that it hasn't worked so theek hai let's relook at it finally coming to the issue of how to do reforms which is the issue look every society has inertia yeah this is uh, newton's laws also say that the natural state is <laughs> nobody wants to do anything but uh, i think a moment comes in the life of a country and i don't know how whether you agree with it but i certainly can feel that there is a certain sense in this country that we are going through a turn in the cycle of civilization almost it's a, it's not just national history but civilizational history and i think that has given a certain urgency to do these things you know we'll go through a demographic shift for 25 years this is our moment if we don't do something in the next 25 years well that moment will have gone uh, whether it's china plus 1 or our or the fact that finally you know being the world's third largest economy is within reach so these are things that give you that feel that reforms can be done so sometimes reforms happen because we are forced to do it so the 1991 reforms were things that we are forced to do uh, you know our economy collapsed uh, our chief ally the soviet union collapsed so very reluctantly we did some reforms that didn't sustain itself for too long 2007 8 etc there was another slow down so some more reforms happened but generally we have been reluctant reformers the change that i see is that we have become an aspirational society so now i think we are doing reforms because we aspire for a better life we aspire to be a global power and i think that in some ways gives it a momentum that doesn't require a crisis to reform 
And I think that is genuinely a change. Yeah. The gentleman, yeah. We have a gentleman on yeah. the right side. Yeah. Stand up. Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. I'm Raj Shvekar from the first year studying in uh, MA Economics. Uh, I have a quite broader question in nature. Uh, I'd like to know your thoughts on this. In the third type, you mentioned that it is necessary to increase the state capacity as well. I mean, economists do agree that there's a severe need to increase state capacity and capabilities in terms of main manpower, efficacy, skills, etc. And in fact, Dr. Ram Singh had also written an article recently on that. And on the other hand, uh, we see that there's a crucial, there's a need to uh, bolster the uh, technological infrastructure as well. And the government is obviously very positive about it. But we see that there's some, uh, uh, that the, the harmony is not there between the two needs. So how do you think, can we synchronize the two Technology needs? and manpower. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we need skilled human resource. And on the other hand, we also need uh, a better technological infrastructure in the country. So uh, how do you think we will be able to synchronize the solutions to these two needs, the need for human resource and the need to bolster the tech infrastructure? OK, we have one question here, uh, left hand side. Yeah. Hello, sir. I am Amit. I am faculty over here in Delhi school, uh, DU College. So my question is, I have been reading your articles about the process reform, and I appreciate that always. But uh, I am I have been wondering why we are not able to you know generate capacity in the courts infrastructure as well as the you know human capital uh, when there are a lot of you know uh, a lot of the assets are trapped. And because of that, we are, you know, the productivity are becoming low and low, especially in few states. Thank you, sir. One last question. Uh, yes, uh, we have a student here. Okay. Uh, Good afternoon, um, panel. Um, You'll have to be louder. <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm from, uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm from a uh, first year uh, student uh, in the Department of Economics and my question is, can you provide insights into the anticipated fiscal implication and funding mechanism associated with the uh, process reform policies? So that's three questions and yeah. all other students, I would encourage you to interact with them over tea in the lawns after this session. So uh, the manpower issue, and I'm going to take a slightly broader view on this than just, you know, this department needs so many people, you know, that's just a, that's the, not the really tough part of this manpower technology issue. You see, we are going through massive changes in technology. There's going to be, you are all users of uh, um, all kinds of new evolving technology, but artificial intelligence, chat, GPT, Genesis, whatever the new stuff is coming and whatever you use to submit your uh, theses to him. <coughs> I know you do it. So the point is that this kind of rapid change, and you know, AI gets all the, all the press. But in fact, there are changes happening at many, many little things all over the place. And that is happening at a pace at which, frankly, <coughs> Um, it is not possible to conceive of the traditional way of doing manpowering. And this is even true of private sector also. How do I know who to hire when I don't even know what, what he, will, he or she will be doing in the future? What will be the technologies of this? And this is one of the areas where actually, this is also, by the way, feeds through to academia. This is going to be a serious, serious issue. Because if you have rapidly evolving technologies, rapidly evolving requirements um, in an, you, you know, the only way to keep up with this is rapid upskilling happening continuously. Now, unfortunately, the way we hire into, whether it's the government hiring 
or even the way we do education is basically it's very front loaded so basically the education of the system is that in the beginning of your life for 25 years you spend if, and 25 years if you happen to be doing higher education uh, into masters level at least for 25 years you get educated then for the next 35 odd years 40 years you're supposed to work right the net result of this current system is that the senior most person in the system is the most outdated he is the he or she is the person taking the the most outdated person in the system is taking all the decisions now this is a rather serious issue so we need to recalibrate the way we do skilling education etc and we have to break it away from this idea that you do some education in the beginning or you do one upsc exam in the beginning we hire you in and then from there on for all eternity till you till you retire you carry on so this even if it worked in the beginning and i don't think it did but even if it worked in the past it certainly does not work into the future so we really need to begin to break this whole thing up and this has to happen at a time when by the way longevity is also going up we are by the way routine most people in this room will basically live till 80 and you will be reasonably fit to go to office every day till at least 70 this is also happening at a time when no pension system in the world will be able to take that demographic hit when the students in this room i will probably survive it because i'll retire earlier but the students in the room i'm telling you when you retire the old pension scheme will not work right there just won't be enough taxpayers to pay your pensions so be prepared to work till 70 but by the way you will be fit enough to do so so this is the world we are living in you work till 70 and all along the way you need to you you run real risk of being uh, technology making you update so we need to recalibrate the entire skilling system such that we actually have to reskill along the way and even rehire along the way now this requires a complete rethinking of the way we do things today so i'm not saying that this has happened very quickly but as a society we need to begin to think about this and the more fluid a society is to be able to take this change the more successful it will be let me give an example what other societies are already facing france regularly now has riots because they are increasing their working retirement age from 60 to 62.5 i think that was what they did now let me tell you if they don't do it even if they did it their fiscal is bust they actually need to work till 67 or something like that to even allow their fiscal systems and pensions to work but even getting it to 62.5 is not going to work and so they are really in this bizarre situation being stuck with a pension system that is bust and a system that does not allow continuous hire it doesn't allow hire and fire and it does not have a system of upskilling so as a result of which this just this hr problem alone is enough to condemn europe to decline but we shouldn't face this now for the beginning in the beginning it won't face it because most people are young so they are going along with the technology and so on but let me tell you even by 2030 onwards we will be old enough that this problem will begin to bite especially if technology is accelerating so we need to create a not not just rules regulations and processes but even a culture where we are continuously upskilling there's a continuous system of um, bringing in new talent but also weeding out those who are unable to keep up with it if you want to keep the system healthy we have to have a fairly creative destruction view of the of this whole thing and you know and also by the way a safety net for those who will not be able to keep up with it there will be a part of the population who will not be able to keep up with it so what do we do with them but this requires a complete rethink and that's something that you know somebody here can maybe do a good research paper on it number two capacities and courts well this is my favorite bugbear which is that look we can't be you know expecting to grow into the future at a sustained pace if our courts have you know 50 million cases stuck in it and it requires a decade to enforce simple contracts it cannot work like this so we need our court system to work 
and this requires many things we need to first of all move away from medieval processes that are there in our court system i mean the very fact that we call our judges milords tell you how medieval it is and those of you who know a little bit about legal systems will know you know when you actually put a petition to a, the legal system it's actually called technically a prayer now this is crazy in the 21st century so we need to drag our legal system from the 18th century to the 21st century and this requires not just the government but also the judiciary itself to appreciate the serious seriousness of this issue i mean we cannot have you know six weeks summer vacations and two weeks winter vacations for our judicial system so we've got to get on with it big topic for you to write a research paper on with clear things that we need to change and you know as a society it is not about government and not government as a society as a country we need to really begin to start a public debate on what needs to be done about the judiciary it is now in my view the single biggest constraint to economic development third process reform and fiscal well it's very difficult to generalize because obviously process reform by definition are about the small very curated changes we need to make so some are, some require some money some re actually pay back money patents actually makes money some of them don't need any money at all just means the process has to change so i will not be able to generalize i'm sorry uh, depends on the specific change that yeah, has to be made um well i hope i have answered the three questions uh, back to you ram <coughs> Is Sanjeev Sandal, respected Professor Pamidua, Professor Ram Singh, distinguished guests in the audience, my dear colleagues and students, and other staff members, a very good afternoon to all of you. Professor Sandal, uh, sorry, uh, it's my great pleasure to to thank our guest speaker, Mr. Sandal. for giving a wonderful talk on the process reforms the importance of nuts and bolts okay so although the reforms are very marginal and small in nature it may or may or may not require much of the resources but that can do wonder in the country like india where the economy is very dynamic in nature we have inherited a large number of laws which are either not useful anymore they have lost their relevance or they were enacted just to just to prevent some wrongdoing at the margin okay so many of them can actually go out of the system and the system can be streamlined in a big way he has proposed five types of five types of uh, measures for process reforms okay and gave interesting examples and also corroborated with the data that how these changes are actually working on the ground so that was excellent excellent contribution now coming to the five types of reforms process reform that he is suggesting the first one is administrative streamlining of existing process and you give the example of voluntary liquidation of company here i am reminded of a panel discussion which happened 30 years back okay just in the, around the mid 90s after the structural reforms was underway and india was actively seeking for investment okay then in that panel discussion a panelist raised the issue of ease of exit okay and gave a very interesting example suppose you are standing in front of the janpath and thinking in front of a shop whether to enter or not okay and then suppose there is a rule that if you enter into the shop you have to buy something okay then only you will be allowed to exit now imagine how many of you will be entering into that shop possibly in my view not nan will enter okay and this kind of barriers which is there is no nothing in terms of entry but actually there is exit barrier which potentially can harm the entry and creates a barrier to entry okay now the second point on changing 
some of the regulations and the examples of IT, BPO sectors was really an interesting one. The third one, which was almost never known, the measure, the Metrology Act, and now it is being replaced by the Janabishas Bill, some provision. some provision, okay? So that's an interesting thing. The fourth one, removing re requirement of state mandated mediation, sorry, the fourth one is adding administrative capacity. Now this has been in the in that in the talk I think from the 2005 onwards. As soon as we moved on to the W2 system of patent protection, that our Indian patent office was severely understaffed and the examination and processing was too slow as compared to all other countries. But it is good to see at least some changes have been done there and, and now things are improving. The fourth one is the voluntary. Uh, kind of mediation in the commercial litigation. That was also very important because as he has repeatedly mentioned and there are questions and he has actually uh, answered. Now what is fascinating in your approach, Mr. Sarnal, is the feedback. Because none of us know absolutely that what will work and what will not work. It all depends on ground realities. Okay? And if you do not have proper feedback system and feedback mechanism in order to influence the policy which can actually help to change, then it is difficult. So the feedback loop and the feedback mechanism, that would be an extremely uh, dynamic feature of any small process reform that we are contemplating. Now, fixing the nuts and bolts of these process reforms, often they may not require enough resources but they actually reduce the transaction cost in a big way and which can help the economic outcome substantially. So that's a major kind of uh, thing that, that is the, the, the uh, takeaway from this talk. Your simpler regulation and smoother process will resonate with the DSE fraternity. And our student is our greatest strength, both in terms of quality as well as quantity you can see, okay? And, and I'm sure that you have already struck a right chord with them and it will resonate in their minds in terms of whatever they do in the future, whether to join the public sector or private sector organizations. Now, let me just thank you once again on behalf of the Lee School of Economics fraternity and thank you for the wonderful lecture. I also thank Professor Dua Professor Dua for chairing the session, Professor Ram Singh for organizing this nice event, and all the staff members of the Delhi School Director's Office and some other staff members for, for all their efforts, students, volunteers, and the students who have attended, the, attended this talk. Okay, I thank all of you, and please join us for tea in the DSC uh, lawn, and you can have more time with the speaker for any other interaction. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, sir. All present are invited to join us for tea and refreshments in the front laws of the building. Mm -hmm. Students there can have an interaction with Sri Sanjeev Sanyal during the tea time. I request all the DSC students in the audience to please remain seated and wait for the guests and the faculty to, faculty to leave first. Thank you.